So I, I am a bit out of my element today. I am a political ecologist. I look at the political economy of environmental change. Can you hear me okay? Um, but my work really deals with human experiences, and human experiences, that is the work of artists. That's who we almost go to to understand um, ourselves and others better through their work, through their music, and through their art. Um, and so I've been uh, grateful that Jin Xu, who is coming this week, uh, has shown interest in my work. And I'm also very grateful that you all are here today and also in, in that way showing your interest in this work. So um, with this presentation, I'm really going to begin um, giving you a global context and starting right now in the present. I'm going to start uh, at last month's climate change talks in Paris. And I'm going to introduce you um, to a few different concepts, particularly something called Red Plus uh, for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And I'm going to talk about the challenge of uh, lowering our greenhouse gas emissions, particularly from deforestation and from palm oil conversion. Then I'm going to bring us to the local context. And I'm also going to take us back in time. I'm going to take us to the Kapowis River in Borneo. And we're going to um, cover some of the materials that I collected through oral history interviews and through other interviews uh, and ethnographic research in this region. I'm then going to talk about relationships. I'm going to talk about the relationship between nature and culture, the relationship between the past and the present, and the relationship between the local, the global, ourselves, and our outer world. And finally, I'm going to finish with a quote um, from Jin Xu's upcoming performance, Solo Rights, Seven Breaths, directed by Garen Negrojo. And I'm going to provide my own context and interpretation of this quote. So at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris last month, 196 different countries uh, came to an agreement, to the Paris Agreement, on how um, or on an agreement um, that they were going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, to such an extent that it would keep uh, the global climate from um, warming more than two degrees Celsius. Now, this agreement was many years in the making. Uh, and one of the core components of the Paris Agreement is something called reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And this really has to do with forest carbon offsetting and the carbon market. Now, upwards to 17% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation and forest degradation and forest fires. This is actually more than the world's transportation sector. To address this, the United Nations, the World Bank, private companies, multilateral uh, institutions um, have all been working together to pilot a market-based approach, Red Plus, uh, to addressing these emissions from deforestation. So red stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And the plus stands for various different things. It stands for the enhancement of forest carbon stocks, biodiversity conservation, uh, and uh, improving local livelihoods. Red plus is one of the key approaches uh, in this new Paris Agreement. So this is what red plus generally looks like internationally. Uh, the red, in terms of the geography, the red circles are different countries that are contributing funds towards Red Plus, and the green circles are the different countries that are recipients of Red Plus funds. Red is envisioned as a form of payments for ecosystem services, in which high-emitting countries and companies such as the U.S., uh, they, they pay rainforest-rich nations and countries um, and communities uh, to conserve their forests rather than to exploit these resources uh, for other economic purposes. Uh, Red Plus recognizes that there are competing land use options in these communities and for these countries, and it attempts to reconcile this through paid compensation for forest conservation. And as you can see, Indonesia is one of the larger uh, recipient countries of these funds. So one of the reasons Indonesia has really been, and, and it has, it has really been in the Red Plus spotlight. Uh, is because it is one of the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters after the United States, uh, actually after China as number one, then the United States, and then the EU. But unlike these other emitters, uh, Indonesia's emissions are primarily due to deforestation and forest loss and forest fires. Uh, so a lot of times when you see the different stats, they're not necessarily including these emissions from uh, forest change and uh, landscape change. Uh, but if you do include these emissions, Indonesia ranks uh, as either third or fourth. 
So Indonesia contains more than half of the world's peat. They have very deep peatlands, tropical peatlands specifically. Um, and because of this, um, they actually have a very high carbon content, not just above ground in the forest, but also below ground in the peat. And uh, peat, these peat swamps are um, also the native habitat of orangutans, and you find these peat swamps um, predominantly in Borneo and in Sumatra. So due to the high acidity of peat soils, most agricultural crops, crops actually don't grow well in these peatlands. The unfortunate exception is oil palm. Uh, palm oil companies have targeted peatlands uh, because the crop does grow well once you uh, drain these peatlands and prepare them properly. Um, and also because of the, the infertility of these soils, uh, they're cheaper than other soil types in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia. Uh, Indonesia has become the largest producer of palm oil. Uh, and giant tracts of, Indo as you probably are well aware, giant tracts of Indonesia's forests have been converted for uh, the growth of oil palm. Now, explaining his village's experiences with the oil palm industry, I wanted to share this song uh, by a man named Rojo. Uh, he is Dayak Ngaju. Uh, all of the individuals that I will talk to talk about today or quote are um, from the Dayak Ngaju tribe in central Kalimantan. Um, he, Rojo is not from one of the villages where I worked, um, but I wanted to share his experience in his community of landscape change and of the oil palm industry. And this video comes from Telepak and Gecko Studios. So when I set out to do this research, I wanted to know if a mechanism like Red Plus and market-based conservation, if first of all it could conserve Indonesia's forests and prevent them from being um, becoming, for example, oil palm plantations. I want to know if it could give local people jobs, a new source of livelihoods. And I wanted to know if um, pricing carbon would change the way that local people and that people in general think about an ecosystem and think about a forest. So to understand the potential impacts of pri pricing forest carbon, I conducted a local to global level study um, of Red Plus. Um, and I, I really, uh, I am a political ecologist, which means I root my work very much in that intersection between uh, human hands and, and the environment, and between um, hum human beings that are on the ground making these transformations um, and, and that environment. And then I work my way up through multiple levels and scales to understand the different pressures that they are experiencing that shapes uh, their relationships with the land. Um, so a lot of this work, even though it was um, from the local to global level, um, was uh, local ethnographic work in, in seven villages in central Kalimantan, where that dot is right there. And it was looking at this particular project. It's the Kalimantan Forest and Climate Partnership Red Plus Pilot Project. Uh, it covers one peat dome. You can think about a peat dome as an upside down watershed. It covers one upside down watershed, a very deep peat. Um, it had a budget, of a budget of 30 million US dollars and it had some big players as partners. It had the Australian government, it had the Indonesian government, the World Bank was actively preparing to join when I was there. Um, it had CARE International, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation, also known as BOSS, uh, and, and seven local communities. 
So the seven local communities where I worked um, were all on the Kapawas River. Uh, the population of these communities combined was about um, 9,000 people, uh, and 90% of the population was indigenous Diaknaju. The religions, uh, the percentages varied from community to community, but pretty much equally uh, a split between Islam and Christianity, uh, with a percentage, about 5% of the percentage of um, the population uh, practicing Kaharingan, um, but more people integrating Kaharingan beliefs uh, into their um, life, their ways of understanding uh, kind of the, 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 the cosmos. Um, and the primary livelihoods of people here, rubber is most important uh, overall, rattan with an agriculture, gold mining, fishing, uh, hunting, the, the bird trade, and the, the, um, also the, the pet trade, um, get more weavings and crafts, various latexes, non-timber forest products being collected um, from the forest, canoe building, um, warungs, uh, which are uh, food stalls and small shops. Now, there are only two roads that go into these villages, uh, one into the most northern village and one into the most southern village. Uh, and they are both in rough condition. Thus, the main uh, transportation along this river is by boat. The landscape is not what you would actually expect from a project to reduce deforestation. Uh, actually, the whole southern half of the project has been deforested already, but it still contains a considerable amount of carbon underground in the peat. It is also not common to view wildlife in this area, and Gonzalez is an exception. Uh, I met him at the, the local sawmill where he lived. Um, there were serious uh, water pollutions in these uh, water pollution issues in these villages, and locals explained that they could no longer eat the fish, the larger fish in the rivers, nor could they drink uh, the water due to the mercury pollution from upstream gold mining. And the peatland forest fires in this region are severe, um, and with these images you see um, me holding some ash that's fallen from the sky. Um, and you see that this, uh, the, the fires actually cause uh, impacts both um, in visibility and for, in terms of health and livelihoods. So one of the things that is really remarkable about this case study on the Kapawis River is that this environmental change, it has all occurred in the people that live there's lifetime. So if you take adults that are 50 years old, all of this has occurred in the last 30 years. When they were 20 year olds, adults, they um, were surrounded by rainforest. So they have seen an incredible amount of change during their lifetime. And this change is even more significant when you consider um, the, the belief system, the Kaharingan the, the belief system is intimately intertwined with the forest and the landscape. Um, and when you consider that the livelihoods, the medicines, um, foods of these people are also um, traditionally all based on the forest and were intertwined with this forest just so recently. So this is a, a simplified historical timeline just to show some of the major events that have impacted these villages over the last few decades. So there was the logging boom uh, from the mid-1970s to the 1990s. Um, and then the forest fires, um, so some major forest fires occurred in close vicinity to the, uh, the villages this year. And then you get into the late 1990s and then almost every year since. Um, and then there was also different external uh, agencies coming in and setting up projects. So first you have the Mega Rice Project, uh, which was uh, initiated by the central government of Indonesia. Then you have uh, the Basmawas Forest Reserve, uh, the Central Kalimantan Peatlands Project, and most recently Red Plus. Um, and then you also have a series of things happening in the region, um, such as the Asian Economic Crisis and the fall of Saharto. So, one of the things, that, things that's really important to remember about local people's experiences with environmental change and on their experiences with development and conservation interventions that are coming in is that um, their past experiences directly influence and weave into their understandings of what's happening today, how they interpret this, and how they react to it. So in one sense, these villages and this is a photo from a different uh, region of, of uh, Kalimantan. And once since these uh, villages are, are very remote, after all, there's only two roads in rough condition going into the, uh, two of the villages of the seven. 
However, um, all seven villages are on the Great Kapuas River, and Borneo is an island of rivers. These rivers um, have actually connected people, local people, to markets outside of Borneo and to people from outside of Borneo um, for many generations, and they've also allowed uh, Nato Dayaks to travel um, within Borneo. And these villages are actually um, young villages. Uh, they were established at the turn of the 19th century, um, and they were first established as Sweden agricultural plots uh, by individuals and by families that were looking uh, to expand their, their land. Um, so talking to village elders, they can, um, talking to village elders just as a demonstration of how interconnected people have been to, to outside markets and the outside world, they can only actually remember one time in which they were disconnected uh, from the outside world and outside markets, and that was during uh, the Japanese occupation from 1942 to 1945, where they really had to figure out ways to be entirely self-sufficient, even making their own clothes from bark. Now, in the Indonesian language, the island of Borneo is called Kalimantan. And this term possibly originates from the Sanskrit word Kalimantana, which some have translated as meaning burning weather island, Kal for a season or a period, and Mantan for burning. In recent decades, the fires in Kalimantan have vis been visible from outer space. Uh, they um, actually billow over Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, southern Thailand, uh, and the Philippines even. And Kalimantan has had this long-held reputation as a place of fires, um, largely due uh, to the practice of Sweden agriculture. Sweden agriculture uh, is sometimes known as slash and burn. It's a traditional approach to farming in Kalimantan and has a long history. Um, the fires were typically set, these fires would typically be set and still are uh, at the, towards the end of the dry season um, with the hope that the rains will then come, the rains will come and help um, put out the fires. Um, and this results, this period at the end of the dry season, um, it gets the local name Muzim Kabut uh, Asap, uh, which is uh, also called Muzim Kabut for short. It's the smoky season. Um, and even though the smoky season does, has existed for as long as local people remember, it has gotten worse in recent decades. And the question is why? So the picture on the left uh, from NASA shows Indonesia's forest fires when viewed from outer space. And that thick cloud of smoke that you see, that is directly over um, the, the communities that we're talking about today. Major forest, of Indonesian, or major Indonesian forest fire years are listed here. You see them intermittently until 1997, 98, and then they've occurred almost every, they have occurred every year since then, uh, but at different levels in terms of the intensity. So one reason given by a local leader for why the fires have gotten worse was the loss of traditional uh, practices for taking care of these fires. Quote, when we do shifting agriculture, we should be working together in one area. People in the past worked together, burning the land and then controlling it. Other major factors contributing to the increased severity and frequency of these fires have been logging. Um, as logging increased in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, so did the amount of uh, dry, uh, decaying matter on the forest floor. Um, and this um, increases the uh, fuel load of the forest and makes it more flammable. Um, also, the weather has always played a very significant role. The El Ninos extend the dry season, which then, thus increases the severity of the fires because they're not put out by the rains. Um, but one of the biggest impacts, um, one of the biggest things impacting the severity of these fires is the transformation of this landscape, um, the dredging of it um, for agricultural purposes, which thereby exposes the peat soil to air. So the most striking example of peatland swamps being drained, dredged and drained, was uh, President Saharto's mega rice project in the late 1990s. And it was, it was a huge project. It covered an expanse of almost a million hectares. Uh, and they uh, successfully constructed over 4,600 kilometers of canals through this landscape. However, it was largely uh, ecologically unfeasible. And uh, due to the acidic and infertile soils of the majority of the area that they were uh, deforesting and preparing for rice cultivation. So from, from 1997 to 1998, a series of things happened quite quickly. First, there was the mega rice project. Then there was an El Nino, a massive El Nino. This was followed by massive forest fires um, in the drained peat of the mega rice project. 
This um, then was combined with the Asian economic crisis hitting Indonesia. And then finally, all of this uh, and other factors um, combined to result in the fall of the Suharto regime after 30 years in power. And this, this whole series of events and catastrophe, uh, you know, ultimately resulting in a catastrophe, um, also resulted in the complete abandonment of this project. So the mega, the mega rice project was at the epicenter of the 1997 to 1998 forest fires, during which upwards to almost two point, or upwards to 2.67 gigatons of carbon were released into the Earth's atmosphere. So this is estimated to be um, upwards to actually 40% uh, of the world's carbon emissions, total carbon emissions during that period. And uh, this map from NASA gives a sense of the global extent of that air pollution during that period. So a man from the village of Kalumpang, he described uh, local experiences with this and the aftermath of the mega rice project uh, with this quote. After the mega rice project, everything got burned. These giant fires stretched from rivers to rivers, like from the Kapuas River to the Burrito River to the Kahayan River. The impact continues until today because of those fires. The mega rice project was local people's first experience with a large scale externally driven development project coming in. And across the local interviews, uh, people describe this project uh, as devastating, as traumatic. They specifically use over and over again the word trauma, which is the same in Indonesian and in English. And as these two quotes demonstrate, the mega price project, it damaged local people's livelihoods and their health. And this aerial map to the left, uh, this is the, the peat dome, the single peat dome um, that the Red Plus project focused on. The southern half still is deforested and scarred um, from the mega rice project. So um, the northern half of this peat dome, where I was also conducting my research, uh, it, is, it is still intact forest, and it's protected by the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. And uh, Borneo, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation, or BOSS, uh, they, were, they established this forest reserve covering this and a whole area above that as well. Um, they established it in 2003 in one of the last fragments of forest area in the region. Now, BOSS uh, unfortunately has a very poor reputation in the local villages. Uh, the word afraid uh, commonly came up in interviews when talking about um, BOSS. And the reason was because of the, the NGO's use of police and their threats uh, to send local community members to jail if they house or they harm an orangutan. Um, but the most common source of friction really is, um, it really has to do with a lack of access into this forest and lack of a, a, you know, declined rights to enter the forest and have access to it and have access to those potential livelihood benefits and the lack of benefits that come from the forest reserve for the communities that border it. So this quote is an example of the friction that exists between local people and boss. Quote, villagers from the hamlets often look for gamor in the boss Mawas area, but the security in boss has forbidden them from doing this. As a result, community members sometimes make fires in the boss area because we are not allowed to enter the forest. Now, a note on Gamor. Gamor is a non-timber forest product, and it's used to make mosquito coils, a mosquito repellent. And obviously, this is important in a region uh, with very high occurrences of um, both malaria and dengue. So, this Red Plus project, the Kalimantan Forest and Climate Partnership, it is the most recent project to enter into these villages. And it's the first time the Australian government and the World Bank have worked in this area. But the communities actually already have experience with these other stakeholders that were involved, uh, BOSS, CARE, uh, the Indonesian central government from those past development and conservation interventions. And thus, when the project entered, um, community members already had some expectations because uh, it was some of the same stakeholders and the same people that were involved. So this is where I get into talking about relationships, starting with the relationship between culture and people and the natural environment. So there's two important themes that uh, arise that, uh, in the interviews that have to deal, that deal with nature and culture. One is, first of all, a deep sense of loss. Um, almost unanimously, local people, um, if they had a preferred landscape, if they're asked what their preferred landscape would be in the region, it would be forest. They, they miss the forest. They miss what has been lost. 
Um, and then the second uh, theme is natural resources are increasingly thought of in economic terms. So first, with uh, remembering the forest, when I asked people what their preferred landscape was, they, they did. They would, they would repeatedly mention the forest. Um, but they didn't want forest in the way that Boss thinks about forest. They didn't want a protected area. They wanted an area that they could really utilize. They wanted to be able to collect non-timber forest products. They wanted to have uh, agroforestry, have fruit trees intermixed with the local species, um, native species. And they wanted to be able to, um, to tap into it for cultural purposes and for, uh, for medicinal plants. Um, so in the past, this was the forest that that they engaged with, because these kinds of um, forests that also had human uses. Um, and for them, they tied these, these uses um, and this kind of forest with uh, livelihoods, livelihood diversity and, and safety. And also important to mention for food security, um, uh, because these forests were very important um, also for, for local sources of food, and both diabetes and strokes have um, become quite rampant um, in the last two decades. So when conducting interviews, um, a question I often ask was, how are things different from the past uh, to the present? And one poignant answer um, to this question was this. Today, everything has value. So previously, if a fisherman caught you know, abundant catch in the river, or if a hunter um, brought home a deer and it was more meat than his family could eat, uh, they would share this with neighbors, with family members, etc. But today, that extra bounty, it will most likely be sold. It will be saved and sold, um, partially due to the decreased availability of meat and of fish. And people's perceptions of the peat soil has changed as well. In the past, degraded, deforested peat soil was basically useless. Um, and this area in the deep peatlands, um, once deforested, is basically a, a wasteland. There's, very, there's almost no uses for this area locally. Um, but now people talk about this soil as carbon soil, and they speculate about the potential income that might come from the carbon market and this carbon soil. So moving into the relationship between the past and the present. One thing that's important to understand about the history of all these development and conservation interventions, which I, which I think has become obvious at this point, is that local people have been through this repeat cycle of hopes and high expectations that maybe you know, they would have a new income from rice cultivation, uh, from the mega rice project, and then major letdowns. And due to the short lifespan of past interventions, locals really worried about that with Red Plus and with the carbon market. Here they had this big promising project coming in, and they questioned, even though they were given all these promises and, and there was all this speculation of income coming in, they questioned how long it would last. Even though it was good for the time being, they questioned what was yet to come. And this, this lack of trust, uh, which locals actually, I, I, one of the terms I heard for it was a trust crisis. Uh, this lack of trust between people, it undermines the potential for collaboration. And this applies to a lot of different things. It applies to development interventions, conservation interventions. It applies to business ventures and to the market. So if local people do not trust these external agencies and individuals coming inside from outside, they will perceive higher levels of risk and then they will change their behaviors uh, accordingly to that risk. So the Kalimantan Forest and Climate Partnership, the Red Plus Project, it actually brought a lot of seasonal jobs to these communities. It did a really good job of distributing these. Actually, every household uh, had the opportunity to have one representative, regardless of age, as long as they were adults, um, be able to have access to one of these jobs and to this seasonal source of income. And people wanted these jobs. But at the same time, locals did worry that if the value of this resource, if the value of carbon, if it actually proved to be valuable, like outsiders were, were promising and speculating, um, what would ultimately happen to them and their access, especially to their local kaboon carrot, their local uh, rubber gardens, and their, their own lands. Um, and so they really worried about the potential that if it, if it was too successful, their rights to the land would actually be usurped from them and they would potentially start, end up with less than they had started with. But luckily people tried to keep things light. Uh, and so there were, there were various jokes about carbon in the villages, um, which I think are quite telling. So one joke goes like this. Carbon is like pulsa. Pulsa are phone cre credits. So carbon is like phone credits. but Phone, credit, phone credits, Pulsa, is much better because although we cannot see it, we can text message and we can call. And another joke um, 
goes like this. I don't believe in carbon because I cannot see it. Like a ghost, you can believe or not. But some people, I, sometimes I can believe in ghosts because some people can see ghosts. So now I, I interpret these jokes uh, more figuratively than I, I do literally. Um, what I see is people questioning the utility of carbon as a resource. That's, what they're that's one of the things they're talking about with invisibility. Um, first of all, due to its invisibility, not, not just simply because it's invisible, but because they don't have the tools with which to calculate its worth. They don't have the access to the instruments to, to consider things like volume and to know what, how to then calculate that volume into whatever economic worth that would be and then how to trade it. And then the second is lack of ownership rights. Uh, their ownership rights to this deep peatland, it's already so weak. They already know that their positioning is very weak with regards to their ownership to this area let alone the, the air. How are they supposed to claim rights to the air? So that was the second issue. And one interviewee uh, summarized the community's challenge with carbon like this. Whether people believe in carbon or not, people don't have jobs or alternatives, so they join the program because they want the work. But if we think about the future, there is no guarantee. It is different from if we plant fruit trees in the forest. When the trees grow, we can see the fruits and harvest the trees. You can see the result, and the result is fruits. But with carbon, we cannot see the result because we cannot see the carbon. So in the end, it seemed like local people's skepticism about Red Plus uh, was valid. It closed prematurely in 2014 as the result of politics surrounding their presidential election in Australia, uh, the unpopularity of the Australian carbon tax, and shifts in Australia's international aid priorities. Thus. Um, the circumstances in Australia actually resulted in this project and these jobs and this potential for, for forest uh, rehabilitation uh, to be lost, at least for now, in central Kalimantan on the Kapuas River. Shortly after the Red Plus project announced it would be closing, two uh, oil palm companies entered into uh, two of the villages uh, that I was researching and uh, made claims on customary lands of these villages. These communities staged multiple protests, and their demonstrations, they actually worked with a local NGO uh, to record some of these demonstrations and some of these meetings, and they then made this into a video which has been posted on YouTube, and this actually made international news on uh, the news agency Mongabe. Shortly after the Red Plus, um, or sorry, um, I, I wanted to show you also this image uh, we're not going to go into the video, but this image um, is from that video uh, that locals made in collaboration with this local NGO. And it shows local people, they're pulling out the, the palm oil trees, the oil palm trees that the, the company had planted on their traditional lands. And then they're replacing them with their own rubber trees. And this holds a lot of significance uh, for Dayak culture. Um, because the way that you would express your, your ownership and land rights to an area wasn't through this piece of paper, but it was through your own interaction with the land and specifically through the planting of, for example, fruit trees and crops. So by taking out the, those palm oil plants and, and replacing them with rubber, they were making this expression that this is our land. Um, Another uh, village, Tumbang Muroi, uh, it organized protests against the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation's Mawas Reserve uh, in 2015 in March. And I think uh, one of the reasons they were able to do this or thought to do this and planned and organized to do this um, was in part because of their experience with Red Plus. Red Plus had provided more uh, benefits than any of the external projects that had come in before. Uh, and it also had given local people a greater voice um, and the ability to democratically vote about various issues uh, regarding the Red Plus project and even whether to be involved or not. So um, emboldened by these experiences, community members encircled the BOSS research station, which you're seeing an aerial shot of it, um, and they demanded that local villages be considered a stakeholder in this protected area. According to one local leader, the village desires that the remaining forest be conserved, but they want the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation to sign a formal agreement with the village, like Red Plus did, so that there can be transparency and room for negotiation in the future. And the village also requested community level benefits um, from this forest and from this program, but even though they want the, the forest protected, they do want benefits like jobs as park rangers, et cetera, um, or also they would, um, are requesting a teacher for their local elementary school. 
And uh, in the future, they do request uh, access to traditional lands that overlap uh, with this area, because currently they're not allowed to enter the forest. So in fall 2015, a uh, catastrophe really hit. Um, due to the El Nino weather pattern this year, um, as well as the considerable expansion of oil palm plantations in uh, recent years in this region, um, and due to the use of fire illegally, uh, both by the oil palm plantations, but also by local people, uh, Indonesia experienced its worst forest fires to date. Um, the exact uh, consequences of these fires is still yet to be determined because uh, it's still technically going on, although um, the severity it, it has declined since uh, uh, October, November. So um, one estimate to give kind of a, a, an idea of the severity of these fires this year, it was estimated that for 21 days from September 1st to October 14th, 2015, the greenhouse gas emissions from peatland fires in Borneo and Sumatra exceeded the daily average greenhouse gas emissions from the whole United States, just from these fires in these two islands. So local people have become increasingly vocal against the government and against these corporations um, and, and calling for action against forest fires. And um, they, the, the level of, of action being taken, it's absolutely unheard of, it's especially if you compare it to, um, in these oral histories, the, how timid people were during the Suharto era. And uh, social media is amplifying local voices. So young people in Kalimantan, they are incredibly adept at using Twitter, at using Facebook, um, and at using uh, YouTube. And I want to share um, the words of one Dayak Naju activist, this is Sinta, uh, and she has been, um, she's played a major role, she's quite young, uh, still working on her bachelor's degree. She's played a big role in organizing these protests uh, in central Kalimantan and getting uh, international recognition from the BBC, Al Jazeera, and many other uh, agencies uh, on this issue. Um, and here's a video of Sinta speaking. Halo, nama saya Sinta. Saat ini saya tinggal di Kalimantan, di Kalimantan Tengah, di mana sekeliling kami PSI level sudah pernah mencapai 2.900. Dan bukan hanya PSI saja, tetapi bagaimana keadaan kota Palangkaraya ini sendiri menjadi kuning, menjadi gelap, segala sesuatu tidak terlihat karena tertutup oleh asap. Banyak sekali anak-anak yang sudah terkena dampak asap di sini, bahkan sampai meninggal. Kalimantan Tengah adalah paru-paru dunia dan kami tidak seharusnya untuk menghirup asap dengan jumlah partikel 2,5 itu mencapai 1 juta, PM10 mencapai ribuan seperti itu. Anak-anak kecil, orang dewasa, orang tua yang ada di Kalimantan bisa menghirup oksigen, bisa menghirup udara dengan bebas tanpa harus takut dengan resiko kematian. Saya percaya segala sesuatu bisa diubah dan kalau kita bersama-sama tidak ada satu hal yang tidak bisa dilakukan. So in our increasingly globalized world, um, we have people that care about us on the other side of the earth. And uh, we also are watching out for them. So this is my friend and my colleague, uh, Ruth Dini Prosti, uh, speaking on a panel discussion with me. Um, and she is Dag Naju. Uh, she learned English from YouTube. Uh, and in her early 20s, she had already become very well known as an activist um, on the issue of mercury poisoning of Kalimantan's rivers due to gold mining. And I contacted Ruth Dini uh, just this past June when I saw this Dayak Naju mat at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, and it immediately made me think of all of the weavers that I knew from the villages. And so I pitched the idea to Dini, what if we what if we try to, just as an experiment, what if we try to sell these, uh, these weavings to the Honolulu Museum of Art uh, at their gift shop? And I pitched it to the, the gift shop too, and they, they said they were open. Um, but I didn't know quite what to expect. So Dini pitched the idea to the ladies, and like seven weeks later, a box arrived with all of these weavings ready, beautiful, of all these wo woven bags. So now seven months later, 21 women have organized and they've developed a cooperative, they've all registered, um, and they have been strategizing on how to improve the quality of the products and the like. We live in an economically globalized world. Uh, 
Obviously, this has a lot of consequences in terms of uh, demands for palm oil, um, for demands of wood and gold, all of which affect the local environment and local people in Kalimantan. Dini and I founded the Kalimantan uh, Weaving Initiative with the hopes that we could, in our own little way, tap into this global economy uh, for the benefit of local culture, local environment, local women, and traditional arts. So. Um, we have a book on the initiative, which you can see later, uh, that's sitting over there, um, as well as just a few uh, examples of the products, um, and, uh, and a book on, uh, that's kind of the go-to book uh, on plated mats and uh, weavings in Borneo uh, sitting on the table there. So I promised that I would end this presentation with a quote uh, from Jin Shu's opera, directed by Garen Nugroho, coming to uh, Hawaii this week. Um, and so I will do that. This quote is from a traditional Adat leader on the Kapowis River in Katunjung village. And I will explain uh, my own interpretation of this quote after reading it. How humans take care of fire is important. They have to give an offering. How do you give an offering to the fire spirits? By doing the Manyangar, Manyangar ceremony. But you did Manyangar and there was still fire. Yes, it's because the spirits were neglected. We were taken from the forest and neglected the ones who live in the forest. The wind, the water, the lands, the wood. So the Manyangar ceremony I am referring to, I'm actually referring to one specific Manyangar ceremony that was conducted uh, at the opening of the Mega Rice Project, that massive million hectare project in the late 1990s. And the Indonesian central government had worked with the local communities to put on this huge ceremony to ask the blessing of the spirits uh, for the success of the project. So I want to understand why, when they went through all of this, did it become such a devastating outcome. But what I learned from this interview and from, from his explanation was actually uh, they did get what they asked for, but there was something very fundamentally wrong with what they were asking for. So they had wanted to be able to extract the timber that was currently there, and they successfully did that. They wanted to be able to clear the land, and with the fires, the fires successfully did that. They wanted to drain the peatlands, and they really accomplished an incredible feat by the amount of, uh, of drainage canals, uh, as mentioned, 4,600 kilometers worth uh, built. And no one died because they had wanted to protect the safety of people during uh, this project. No one died uh, while doing this project. But what wasn't included in their request to the spirits uh, was the safeguarding of the forest and also the safeguarding of future generations. I'm going to end um, with one last quote, um, which is not in uh, Jen's opera. And this quote is um, from the same Adat leader. Uh, and I asked him a question that I asked so many different people. Uh, along the Kapowis River. I asked, what do you think is the biggest environmental problem here? And most people, practically everyone, said uh, forest loss and forest fires. Um, but his, law, his answer was not that. And I think his answer really embodies the challenge that we are all up against uh, at both the local level and the global level. And this was his answer. Thank you.